Coming up on Market to Market, as you assemble around your table, we do the same to check economic conditions everywhere from Main Street to the fields of America. Dr. Ernie Goss and regular market analyst Chris Robinson, next. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next because a pioneer, our name, is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, November 24th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The Thanksgiving holiday features the dinner table as the centerpiece of sharing stories of thankfulness and the year that was. This week, we are holding our own table discussion about the economy in rural and Main Street America. Ernie Goss is the McAllister Chair and Professor of Econ Economics at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Chris Robinson is Managing Director of Agriculture and Commodities at TJM and a regular market analyst on the program. Good to see you both. We'll talk to you in just a moment. Good to be here. Stand by. We are recording on Tuesday, shortening an already abbreviated trading week for the week. The nearby wheat contract added four cents, while December corn gained three cents. Continued hot and dry weather in South America put a damper on the soybeans crop size, as the January contract improved 37 cents, and December meal strengthened 590 per ton. December cotton shrank by a dollar 58 per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, December class three milk futures decreased 28 cents. The livestock market was lower. December cattle fell 75 cents. January feeders cut 17 cents, and the December lean hog contract lost 280. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index shed 35 ticks. December crude oil added $1.93 per barrel. Comex gold put on $18.90 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index improved more than nine points to settle at 565.50. Let's bring back now Dr. Goss and Chris Robinson. Chris, I'm going to start with the economists for a minute, all right? Ernie, give me, as we look at this Thanksgiving holiday, mm -hmm. a chance to pause and reflect. <clears throat> What's the state of the economy in rural America right now? It's weak and weakening a bit more. Uh, we're seeing the uh, interest rates, the higher interest rates, beginning to take a, take a negative impact on the rural Main Street economy, as we call it at Creighton. We do a monthly survey, as you know, of uh, banker, bank CEOs in rural areas of 10 states, including Iowa and Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, right down the middle of the country, and even west to Colorado and Wyoming. So they're reporting not such good conditions. The third straight month of below growth neutral readings uh, concern about the interest rates. Also, uh, in certain states, uh, of course, the drought is having some, still having some impacts in the, in, in the farm sector, and it's it's causing some real concerns. Our confidence index, we asked to look out six months. The bankers are not very optimistic. In fact, it's the worst confidence index that we recorded since 2006 when we started the survey. So that's the bad. That's the bad news. There, there was some good news, I guess. We'll get to that later. But we, economists, we we tend to focus on the, the negative news. You know. Well, I, I read your reports, the two that come out well, each thank month. Thank you. And and there, yes, there has been a strong sentiment downward. Is it mm -hmm. only tied to interest rates? That was one of the things you mentioned. No, no, we're talking about a global economy, of course, that's weakened. We're talking about, now Xi Jinping, of course, was in the U.S. Uh, last week, and of course, he's, uh, he won't admit it, but there's a recession going on in, in China, and that's telegraphed back here to the Midwest, the midsection of the country. We're also talking about uh, uh, Europe, slow down there, uh, recession in, in Germany, that's had be, that has some negative impacts. And, and, of, and again, some weather-related issues in agriculture, and Chris would know far more than I would about that. Well, Chris, what he said sound consistent with what you are hearing? Yeah, I think the overall picture, I think people are concerned certainly about the, the rise in interest rates. The Fed 
In 17 months, they they hiked Drake's 11 times. You know, five 525 you know, points. That was a huge, unprecedented move. And now you're starting to see its effects. The last couple times with the uh, unemployment numbers and the uh, inflation numbers, so they're starting to see a little bit of a blip down in inflation, and a little bit of kind of what I think what they were looking for. They were looking for a decrease in employment because the employment mm, market's right. been on fire. That's uh, the odd thing about economics, right? The, the bad news is good news, vice versa. So um, the positive thing I would say about that, you mentioned interest rates, was the fact that it looks like we've potentially, that the Fed might be done raising rates. So if that's true, that may help people moving forward because rates may come down. You've already seen a big correction in the 10-year. The 10-year is the kind of the, the uh, benchmark for all borrowing. You know, so that might be one positive thing to look ahead of. If the Fed is done, maybe the worst is behind us. Well, I'll give you a chance then to answer that question. And Shane in Nebraska has a question for you too, uh, Dr. Goss. What would prompt the Fed to start lowering interest rates? Is it a possibility that Fed rates could be a couple points lower over the next two-year span? They will be. They will be lower. But not much lower. They can't, we can't revisit these low rates. These are record low interest rates. And when we talk about high interest rates today, we're comparing it to back to 2008 and 9 forward. Look back even further. I mean, when I bought my first house in 1983, I paid 10 and a quarter percent on that. Now we're talking about 8% on the same loan. So the, what we're talking about now is almost normal. Now the normal over the last 50 years, for example, the funds rate, that's the one that the Fed sets, is about 4%. Now, uh, now as Chris said, now it's five and a quarter to five and a half. So we're not much above that. So if they do, and I expect them to raise interest rates as early as the middle of 2024, you're probably talking about no more than 2%. That's, that'd be my expectation. Probably not even that, because we don't want to go revisit this putting so much pressure on the economy, these inflated values all the way across the board, whether it's stocks, whether it's ag land, farmland, all those have been inflated because of these ultra low interest rates that are just not sustainable. Those are unsustainable. Look at the credit right now. Look at the credit of everyone. That's college students. That's the U.S. government, the federal government. All this, too much credit out there, and now they're paying, they're having to pay the price for that credit. But uh, we, consumer price has dropped, producer price has dropped. Some of these inflation measures have retreated, but then retail sales mm. retreated. Mm. Back to what Chris is saying about the unemployment number. Mixing these two together, are you saying that we're probably at the, the new normal for interest rates? We're above, a little bit above the new norm. A little norm. bit above. A little bit above, so not if you significant. Had to, at a new norm, what would it be? A new norm would be about, uh, in terms of the, uh, say, the mortgage rate, 30-year mortgage rate, it would be about 7% 7 instead of 8%. In terms of uh, uh, growth in retail sales, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at for this buying season, the holiday and Christmas buying season, I expect 3 to 4% increase. About 3% of that is inflation. So we're talking about unit sales, you know, if you want to call it unit sales, almost flat to 1% increase. So we need to adjust our thinking because it's, it's a new normal, and the new normal is going to be higher interest rates. The idea that th what happened after 2008 and 9 is the Fed, the Federal Reserve, pushed rates to abnormally low levels, and we are all now paying the price for that. And guys and gals in my class, they're like, whoa. And I'm like, get used to it. It could be worse. You've seen it. You've Absolutely. seen it worse. Oh, sure. So from a decision making on the farm, we've heard this notion here in the last couple of months of maybe some people are making sales to not pay storage because of interest rates. Are you hearing that? Absolutely. I mean, you basically had free money for 15 years, roughly, mm -hmm. yeah. in general. I mean, and, you know, if, depending on when you were born and when you went to high school, it's been a, a shock to see things move up. So it's people are adjusting mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to affect everybody's. Your operating loan is going to be different and uh, your banker is probably going to have a different conversation with you right now and, and your spreadsheet is going to be more and more important. Um, I think that, uh, that that's something that's going to, you know, continue. If you're, if you're farming, I don't care if you're a producer or if you're a rancher, the cost of money is never going to be zero again. So that's something we're just going to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right. 
let's dip into the commodities for just a minute here, Chris. I'm going to go to wheat for a moment because that has been, and, and Ernie, you get to talk about the wheat states in a minute. Uh, this market continues to, each week I seem to ask the same question, is it only Black Sea? But what's the domestic wheat story doing to our, as we closed on Tuesday at 5.55 on December? We're at two and a half to three year lows, depending on which of the three contracts you look. We had one rally in July, which that was about it. We, and then since July, we've had a, I'd call it a horrendous sell-off, really, if you're a wheat producer and if you had uh, no hedges on to drop $2.50 to $0.03, cents, depending on if you're talking spring wheat, Chicago wheat, or the KC wheat, we are at or near um, you know, contract lows, two-and-a-half-year lows. And the last numbers that the USDA gave us, there's, there's plenty of supply. So um, we'll have to see what goes on. The other thing is, too, you've seen a, the, a huge supply, really, that's come out of Russia. They've continued to sell. They've hit every bid. Um, and I think that's what's the most surprising thing about 2023. If you say what's surprising, if I had told you all the geopolitical stuff was going to be going on, you'd think, my goodness, you know, wheat and corn would be ex uh, super more expensive because every weekend we were concerned about what's going to happen in the Black Sea, what ship is going to get hit, how is it going to affect, uh, and it really hasn't. And I think that's the one surprise that the, um, the geopolitics really didn't affect the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, there's plenty of supply out there. And the interesting thing was, a year and a half ago, two years ago, I can't remember exactly what it was, but when this fall started with the Ukraine, the UN famously said, oh, we have six weeks left of wheat. And that was literally the stone cold high. So there's a danger of trading um, uh, headlines. Experts, I think a lot of experts miss this. Headlines in many of your states mm -hmm. that you survey are wheat states. Are they telling you and any of your results paying attention to the Black Sea, or are they just hyper-focused on it hasn't rained, I, I, I'm struggling on a, a, a cheap crop out of Russia? What are those farmers in those <clears throat> wheat states telling you? Well, we're surveying the bankers, and they're telling us what the farmers are telling them. So, and I'm a bit removed from what the farmers are saying, but I do go out and speak to farmers, so I'm not completely cut off from that. But right now, there are concerns about uh, more domestic. For example, Iowa, Iowa's uh, pork production is very important, number one pork producing state in the U.S., and of course, uh, Proposition 12. And, that's, and we, the bankers report every month, get reports about, well, concern about hog production, concern about selling. And Massachusetts, of course, now has implemented uh, some uh, proposition. I don't know what it's called in Massachusetts, but nonetheless, it, that's, there's more of domestic. That's, that's what the bankers are telling me and us, Creighton University, about what's going on. You do have an anecdote about hog production in Iowa, a significant loss, I think one of the banks told you in the, in the survey this week. Yeah, there was, there was significant loss in, in, in just uh, as a result of just, just regular day-to-day -day production sales. So that, I couldn't give you the exact quote, but it was not positive. And the reports, particularly on, in livestock, has been more about uh, pork production or hogs and not so much about cattle and of course poultry as well. So, and now we're approaching, of course, turkey. Mm -hmm. Three, you know, a couple of days before turkey day. A lot of corn farmers are done. We're, I think, 93% complete as we sit here right now, Chris. They're gonna be able to enjoy maybe a holiday, but are they going to enjoy the price? It depends on if they did any forward selling or if they hedged anything. Um, you have a lot of opportunity this year if you count the number of days or weeks where we were north of $6 corn. Um, are actually high with, you know, was that June, July spike? I think a lot of people thought, here we go, we're going to go back to $7. And uh, so it just depends. If somebody did some marketing, you had opportunities there. If you've done nothing, you know, you do the math 629 minus 461, it's a dollar 60 and change. That's, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a revenue bump if you did nothing. So now people are going to store it. The question is, do you have to pay for storage? Is it on-farm storage? There's some carry in the market, but it depends on how much it costs you to store that corn. We are talking about interest rates. Um, a lot of wheat producers are looking at carry. Uh, again, but it depends on your 
balance sheet. It depends on what it costs you to store because uh, farmers will hold it until they absolutely positively have to sell it. And um, I think moving ahead, people are going to wait and see. Are we going to get a South American market where we get a bump up and they get a chance to hopefully this time sell into the rally instead of waiting? So the time machine's broken for many, <laughs> last I knew. Yeah. If you've missed this window, what do you do? I mean, you, you just kind of said maybe hope. Hope's a tough marketing strategy. S mm. SOS, sell on strength um, and keep a cheap put under. The time for expensive uh, insurance is when we're at $6.30, $6. That's when you had something worth protecting. But at $5 or four sixty. dollars I think you keep a uh, kind of a disaster floor under it and look for rallies to sell. Uh, if you don't have to pay for storage, you're in a different group than somebody does. I think if you have to pay for storage, you have to do the math. It might, that makes sense. So you could see a capitulation here. It's the farmers that will have to sell, and I can tell you who's going to be pulling this, the trigger on a lot of these sales, it's going to be their bankers because these uh, gentlemen are, and ladies are going to have to go in and say, hey, I'm looking at an operating loan for next year. And they're going to say, okay, well, where are your assets? What are they worth? Mm -hmm. Not what, what were they worth in July. It's what they are worth right now. So I think that's going to be the decision. It's going to be a business decision. I'm going to go to a question that a little bit inspired, I think, by your former boss and a frequent guest on this show, Mark Gold. And Tim in Minnesota is asking a question. And this, this is all seriousness about what happened, but in many ways. Are Brazilian beans as overheated as fans? at a Taylor Swift concert and Argentine <laughs> crops. Is their drought broken is the question. And the reason I, I, I find this to be legitimate is what Mark said. He says, there were a lot of people at this concert and it was a 140 degree heat index where this concert was. Was this a, a, an actual data point to some traders to say, oh, it really is a serious deal in Brazil? Because we talk about it every week in beans. I, I think it depends on how how the impact is, and we really won't know till they start harvesting their beans. A lot of people thought we had lost a big chunk of our crop this year when it was hot and dry, and the yields ended up coming in a lot better than people thought. So I think as a, as a point, it's gonna be a point of discussion. It certainly gave producers who needed to move soybeans here in the U.S. a, a good rally. We had a, a, an outstanding rally, rally at $1.20, $1.15. Uh, certainly the Chinese came in and bought on those five months lows. We had the, one of their biggest sales uh, uh, all year and, and, and quite a while uh, from China. So again, you're going to see end users buying dips. And I think if you're a producer, no matter what it is in the headlines, if it's a weather issue, if it gives you a bump up, take a look at rewarding that with a sale. $14 seems to be, though, that heavy resistance. Yeah, for the spot month. Absolutely. For the spot month yep. ahead. So... Am I waiting to see what's going to break it through? Is it a continued hot, dry story? Or does there have to be something in the United States that, that causes us to, to go higher? I think you have to see continued buying from the Chinese, number one. And number two, it's going to ha have to be a hot and dry story. It's, okay. And you'll see it. We've already seen tremendous volatility. One change in the weather forecast. You know, we, in two days, we rallied 50 cents. And then... Today, which was Tuesday, we dropped 25 cents and then we came back. So you're going to continue to see that movement uh, with every changing weather forecast. Ernie, I'll get your thoughts on livestock in a moment. You've already kind of teased us a little bit on something, but I want to finish up on live cattle because we had a, a little bit of a story last week with cattle on feed uh, deemed to be a neutral to maybe possibly bullish. But this live cattle story is a consumer story, has been, it appears, in the last 8 to 12 months. Looking at that price and the close on Tuesday tell you that we are now headed back lower? I think if you look at that chart, and you got to remember, for three years we went, it was higher, how much higher are we going to go? How much higher are we go? So we've had our first really serious correction. Um, I would say this, if you're looking at these prices, you know, 170 is better than 140. So rather than worry about, you know, are we going to go back to uh, you know, rally another 15, 20 bucks higher, make sure that you don't let it get any worse and, and stop the, the kind of the monkey business of trying to say, well, this is the low, this is the high. Um, I think the market's going to continue to move. And we talked earlier about the overall economy. The first thing people do, if, there's a, if, this, if this is going to be a soft landing or a hard landing, and again, it depends. The first thing people will do, if, if, they're, if they're experiencing a hard landing, they're not going to buy steak. 
So, Ernie, the the story we can't say that we, you always say that the, uh -huh. the 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 economy is not based on the stock market, but all of a right. sudden the equities certainly responded last week, and it flipped the script on hard landing, soft landing, like Chris said. Shouldn't it have? It shouldn't have. No. Why not? Is it? We're talking about seven, the magnificent seven, leading the whole stock market. <clears> if you look at the Russell two thousand. Small, you know, a small uh, uh, company index. It's not up. That it's up one to two percent. I mean, the stock market's not the economy, nor are these seven companies the uh, stock market either. I mean, in other words, it's over. Investors are going. A little, they're too far in. I think. In other words, this is too much optimism for so little. I mean, I'm not saying the economy's not in a recession. I'm just saying this market is overheated, at least those seven stocks. And this evening, one of the, uh, this NVIDIA will be announcing, and based upon AI, artificial intelligence, I was there when we had browser, internet, internet was going to do everything. Well, it didn't at first. It took time. This is going to take time. Don't over, we're getting too excited about something that's may or it's not going to happen for a while, the impacts, the positive impacts of that. But the stock market, sorry. On, on the stock market. Uh, Livestock-wise, in again, your bankers mm -hmm. in your area, do you know of heavy anecdotes yet of calling notes on some of these livestock producers after just a short amount of time after being so high for so long? Now, here's the positive. The bankers aren't that, they're not that concerned about the condition of the farmers. The farmers, even though we've had a 2023 income, is, farm income is down from 2022, 2024 is projected to be lower by USDA from 2023, yet the farmers are not in critical condition like some of the businesses on what we call rural Main Street. Those, that's where the problems are, and we're, we're seeing that. And the farmers, there, there are, they have increased uh, some of the collateral requirements, but not much. Look at what's going on with farm land prices. According to our survey, continue to grow despite, despite these higher interest rates and where we're seeing some impacts on farm equipment sales. Now, farm equipment sales down for five of the last six months, according to the bankers. So there are some issues out there, but it's not nearly as dire for the farm economy as more of the rural economy where the, these uh, bankers reside, I would say. And, I, I, and they, I, I get that. No delinquencies, not much. Uh, farm loan defaults, almost not, not there right now. Now, we have to look ahead now. Again, where are interest rates going? 90% of our bankers said no to another rate hike. The Fed meets again on the December the 12th and 13th. There will be, no, as we see here today, there will be no rate hike on that. That that was two days. Which means, Chris, uh, does that? Do you think somebody's going to start expanding their feedlots, at, uh, or have they missed their window on on getting back into this feeder market? Well, you just the contract. Depending on which contract you look at for live cattle, I mean, it's it's a dip to buy. If you're if you're a person that you think that you know we're going to be higher and the economy is going to be fine, but I will tell you this: ranchers are not going to buy animals unless the math works. Period. So I don't care if you're a cow calf or something like that. So it's going to come down to the numbers, and we'll see. A lot of it's going to have to depend too on what the price of corn is, the, your inputs. Mm -hmm. Uh, soybean mill has just gone through the roof with the issues in South America. So that really impacts. You were talking about the uh, hog producers because a lot of that is, you know, directly meal related. Uh, so yeah, I think if the numbers work, you know, for the ranchers will will keep, you know, trying to grow the herd. But on a drop like that, it, it makes you think that maybe that is an opportunity. But you're saying it doesn't look like we have evidence to to the contrary. No, I think to the positive there. Yeah, okay. I would I would say based on what we've seen, yeah, there might be some more to go. Final minute here uh, on hogs. Uh, again, a continued story in just two short days of trading lower again. This is just it, there's not been a positive. Is there any positive coming in hogs? Contract lows, or we're about to in the, in the front month. The positive, look at the thirds. Go out to uh, July, August. I was looking at that, and talking to some clients today. There's still 95, 96 cents out there. So there's a disc, there's an opportunity out there. The other kind of negative piece of news we got yesterday: the Chinese, their economy is slowing down. They had 42% more hogs right now than they did this time last year. So they have an oversupply, 
And that's, again, it all trickles down at the end of the day. A, a big part of the demand comes from China. So I think that was something where people pushed down. Um, and, and we'll see, you know, how that works out. But at the end of the day, we still have a pretty good-sized herd. Okay. Very good. Yep. Chris Robinson, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Goss, thank you. Hang around for just a couple minutes, will you please? Will do. All right, we Love have, to. We need to hear more from him. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we're going to pause our analysis, as I said, and continue our discussion about these markets and more in our Market Plus segment. You can find both analysis and plus on our website of markettomarket.org. It is card writing season, so how about you spend some time telling us about the first time that you watched our program? Send us an old-fashioned email to markettomarket at iowapbs.org and we'll open up a conversation. Next week, we'll look at how U.S. poultry producers are working to handle recent HPAI outbreaks. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.